Okay, you guys are good. Hey, good morning. Sorry about technical difficulties. We're live and sometimes the computers are not our friends. Technology <laughs> is our friend, technology is our friend. So good morning. I'm Meg Riley in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We'll have our hosts and guest hosts introduce ourselves quickly and then we wanna move very quickly to our guest with whom we are going to speak and very excited. Michael Tino, how are you? I'm doing okay, Meg. This is Michael Tino uh, in Peekskill, New York where winter has returned because you know it's winter so it's it's fine everything is good many things are exploding all around me but i had a vacation last week and i understand we have the good reverend don fortune joining us as a guest host how are you don good morning i am well um i am reverend don fortune i serve our congregation at the uh, south Shore of New Jersey, uh, at the South Jersey Shore, I am apparently under caffeinated this morning, um, where <clears throat> spring keeps threatening, spring keeps threatening here, um, but life is pretty good, we're gearing up to start stewardship, so that's keeping me busy these days, so who would like to go next? Margalie Belazaire, what are you doing this morning, where will people be able to find you? Hi, Margalee, providing tech support, <laughs> technical problems, as we said earlier, and I will be on Facebook and on Twitter, and I'll post your questions for um, our guests and uh, panelists to respond to, so uh, those are the places I'll be, Facebook, Twitter. I will complain about the amount of snow we have in Minnesota later, because I'm so excited about our guests today. Dr. Pamela Leitze is the Vice President for Academic and Student Affairs at Meadville Lombard Theological School. Dr. Leitze is also an ordained elder in full connection with the United Methodist Church. She's a member of the Northern Illinois Annual Conference within the denomination. And Dr. Leitze, I followed you on social media for years before you went to Meadville because you've been so deeply involved with this United Methodist struggle and such a good source of wisdom. So why don't we just start by your sharing kind of what happened this week? Well, let's start by saying, I'm really sorry. I am, my heart, I think all of us, our hearts are just with our queer beloveds who are United Methodist and um, just really grieving what it means for United Methodist and also just for the world. So catch us up. Well, thank you, Meg. It's my pleasure to be with you all today. And I thank you for your very kind words of introduction and to know that you've been following me also blesses my soul this morning. Um, I am uh, actually in my office after a very uh, difficult general conference of the United Methodist Church. Perhaps I'll start there. Our general conferences are international affairs because our church is a global church. We meet only quadrennially, which is every four years, but this year is an off year. We're meeting, this is only the second time in the history of our denomination that we have met outside the, of the quadrennial format. And the reason we met it was is because since 1972, We've had discriminatory language in our book of discipline, which is kind of a legal document for how we are structured. It contains our constitution. It contains legislation by which we, we commit to governing ourselves. That discriminatory language has been a thorn in the flesh of the denomination and has been a pain for many members of the LGBTQ members for several decades. At our last general conference, um, it was so painful uh, that the delegates, these are the representative body, this is the representative body during the quadrennial meeting, uh, said to our bishops, look, we, we, need to, we need to do something that will settle this issue for us. We have uh, differing opinions, that's apparent. Uh, we have a conservative right-wing faction uh, in our church that is advancing more and more discriminatory language and behavior. And we have our uh, moderates who are, so, uh, some people think are in the middle of, others of us think they're, you know, that, that they need to make a commitment. And then there are the liberal 
um, membership, what one would call liberal theologically in our denomination that includes our LGBTQ community. Um, the bishops were asked to develop a plan so that we can make a decision about the direction of our church. This is not unusual for, our, for, for many Protestant denominations over the last several decades. They've had to make a decision to ascertain what direction the church would go in. Uh, unlike any of those churches, we decided uh, that we would in, that we would um, support a what is called a commission on the on a way forward, which was to be a representative body not of bishops but a representative body of the church to develop a plan so that the church might stay uh, together, given though given our differing opinions. And so the Commission on a Way Forward set out its plan. Uh, it fully supported a plan that it brought that it was to bring to General Conference called the One Church Plan. Others of us felt that the One Church Plan did not go far enough and indeed left some discriminate, discriminatory sections in our Book of Discipline, particularly how, how we finance our ministry. And so we developed what, was, what is called the simple plan. Of course, once, once, um, you know, once all these plans came together, including uh, the very harmful tra traditional plan that goes so many steps uh, forward with more and more painful legislation, more problematic than we've ever seen before. Uh, once that traditional plan was in play, we just simply felt uh, uh, persons who helped write the simple plan felt that we could not uh, in good conscience allow a traditional plan to hit the full floor without a response from those of us who want and know that our denomination could do better. So we gathered at our special general conference over the weekend and ending on Tuesday uh, to determine which of these several petitions, legislative petitions would be selected. Our bishops were very optimistic and thought that in fact, the uh, one church plan, which is a sort of, which is a plan that um, um, has many elements, but I mean, the fine line of that plan is that annual conferences, jurisdictions can determine how they want, what, you know, how they want to, what they, and how and what portions of the discipline related to what they call human sexuality, they in fact want to abide by. They thought they had buy-in from many of the delegates and thought that that plan would be approved at our general conference. Uh, from the time the general conference began, we saw quite quickly that the one church plan, which was being touted by so many representatives and uh, so much of our episcopacy, we saw that that plan was not going to um, prevail. Um, and, and largely it was impossible in my opinion for the plan to prevail in, in any shape or form because we simply did not have the votes given that we are a global church and given that our conservative right-wing faction has been working in uh, with our many of our many members of our central conference in very despicable ways, might I add, in order to ensure their vote. And so the end of that, um, the end of our session was uh, the acceptance of a plan, a traditional plan that even going in our judicial council, which is in sort of to unpack it, it's sort of like the Supreme Court of the United Methodist Church even going in the traditional plan had constant, had been portions of it had been deemed unconstitutional. And yet that traditional plan with its many unconstitutional elements was embraced and accepted by uh, the majority of our um, delegates, voting delegates. And, and so what the world saw was um, many of us, including myself, who were, de who were determined that we would not allow such evil to be, to have the, the, the last, to be the last and final voice echoing from the halls of judicial council. 
And so many of us protested adamantly, vocally against that plan. And um, 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 we ended up um, uh, with our delegates, the good work of many of our delegates, being able to at least uh, get that traditional plan referred back to our judicial council for its full review before it is in fact implemented. So I have so many questions. <laughs> I, I ran our Washington DC office years ago. I've been gone for 15 years, but at the time there was a group called the Institute for Religion and Democracy started by Mark Toomey, a former CIA agent, which existed to um, perpetuate homophobia and sexism within moderate denominations. Are those the people you're talking about when you talk about the people organized? Because they had a vast amount of resources. And even when I was in DC, they would shut down the offices, uh, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, if they stepped even a toe towards being um, non-homophobic. Are those the folks who did the organizing here? Was there a group behind this? I, I'm, I haven't followed the ins and outs of who got this vote. And also who were the delegates? Who, who was allowed to be a delegate and who picked them? Right. Let me start with your latter question. Delegates are selected by their annual conferences. Annual conferences meet annually as it's in the term and leading up to any general conference, they select who their representatives will be. Therefore the delegates all 864 uh, actually on the roll, came from uh, the United States, uh, countries within Africa, and those countries within Africa had the largest percentage of international delegates. So it was done by population, kind of, how many delegates you got? Absolutely. Uh, Africa, the Philippines, East, East, East Asia, and so forth. Uh, so those are our delegates. Who is financing this uh, bigotry? IRD is one of many groups who are financing this. I've been a target of IRD, and so I'm well aware of their tactics. I'm well aware of them and they of me. Um, not only IRD, but we do have factions within uh, some of, it comes, should come as no surprise, within some of the most conservative geographical regions of our country, largely Texas and the South, what we call the Southeastern jurisdiction. That is not to say that we do not have a large contingency from other areas of our country, uh, because in fact we do. There are delegates from, all of, from many areas within our country who make it to the floor, even some who one would think is moderate because every delegate votes their conscience. So you have no idea about how a delegate will ultimately vote. And indeed, if you listen to the proceedings, you heard that there was some concern with the new technology that the names of vote of delegates and at the ways in which they were, were voting would be known. And so they were very concerned about that. The way this is being framed by mainstream media is that it was all about Africa. How would you, how would you analyze who really is perpetuating um, this move, not only not forward, but backwards as, opposed, as bigotry? Well, I'm doing my best to critique that analysis that this is, this is somehow the fault of African delegates. Again, we are a global church and to be a global church a predominantly white global church at that comes with a history of colonialism. Okay. And so while our African delegates are growing in terms of their political power in our church, they alone did not have enough votes to push forward the traditional plan. So, you know, you know, the, here, here in lies the truth there. It was a voting block of conservative delegates across our denomination. 
Yes, largely in those areas that I've spoken about already on this broadcast, but but not exclusive of uh, a number of delegates in other areas. And, and I would also venture to say perhaps also moderates who could not bring themselves to, to voting for a more uh, a liberal plan. And, and, and so there, there, we, there we were. Again, I'm just so sorry. And I, I, I wonder, and it may be too soon to ask this. So, you know, our church, I mean, one thing that I was glad about is the churches keep their money if they leave at least and they keep their property. Do you think a lot of churches, universities, seminaries, how, how is there, was this such a shock that it went so far that like no one's had a chance to think about that yet? Or is there a, a thought about a new, more progressive Methodist denomination? Or, I mean, I noticed that the Washington office, which I still get their emails, was very con condemning of this, just flat out said it was ungodly and, you know, just no two ways about it. And I thought, good, I'm really glad they didn't feel called to be moderate or something, whatever you want to call that. Um, because when I was in DC, they were kind of muzzled all the time. So I was really glad that, that it was clear. But I'm, I'm curious what you think. And if it's too soon, I get that. I mean, this just happened. So. Well, it's, yeah, in some ways, it's too soon to speak about what course we'll take. I've been saying to friends right now, we need some time to really to heal and to have a period of renewal. I immediately came back to work and, you know, there was some concern from my loved ones about me coming to work. But being at Meadville has been a, um, a bomb to my soul. And, and I love what I do. I love my work. And so I'm the kind of person who, you know, I throw myself into my work and I move forward. Um, and that's what that's what I'm trying to do. And I'm having conversations with good people such as yourselves and the conversations for me and I know for others, they're cathartic. They help us to flesh out how we're feeling and to come to terms with where we are in our spirit. Um, the issue of money is a major issue, I want to say, Meg. Um, the petitions that made it to the floor uh, the first levels of discussion were levels of discussion about money, property, pension, and property. Now, what the viewers did not, many viewers did not know who are not Methodist, United Methodists did not know, is that there has been a faction uh, from among those, the conservative right wing. And I, I think they brought in some uh, moderates also uh, they began to talk about what's uh, on, on the development. They, they, they wanted to make it innocent. And so they called it the, the Wesleyan Covenant Association. The Wesleyan Covenant Association is nothing more than the beginnings of a new denomination under the umbrella of the term covenant. We just want to come together and have conversations. But it is the very... Um, members of the Wesleyan Covenant Association, the Boyettes, whose name was on the petition about pension and disaffiliation and that sort of thing. It's those persons who are part of the Wesleyan Covenant Association who put forth at the very beginning of our general conference, conversations about money, pension and pack and property, which led many to believe as we've been thinking for quite some time <clears throat> that this group in fact wanted to leave the church with their riches intact, so to say. Uh, and so that um, while to the outsider, their plan may look innocent. It may seem like, oh, well, well, at least people who are leaving will get to take their churches and their monies and have their pensions. This, there is an underlying evil that supported that legislation. And that underlying evil was that that legislation was not for the benefit of, of, of the LGBTQ community. That legislation was for the benefit of the conservative right-wing branch of our church. 
Uh, and so I, I would love for your um, viewers to understand the background to that and, and not, not, and to know that uh, we saw that as an, uh, as, as uh, a not helpful moment. And indeed, uh, there were there were some who were on the fence, uh, persons who ultimately got to say, wow, is this really about money? And um, we got a chance to really, for themselves, identify what was going on. Um, much of what is going on in our congregation in this conversation, it's not about human sexuality. Were this about human sexuality and really getting at what they call the sins that are involved in human sexuality, then petitions, then the amendments that address um, um, polygamy, the amendments that address um, divorce and remarriage, the amendments that address adultery, all these things for the biblical, biblically literate are seen as sin. And yet those things, and yet the, many of those delegates rushed to the floor to ensure that those amendments were not made to the traditional plan. Because in fact, this is not about biblical literacy. This is about power and control. I, I'll end that there. Dr. Lightsey, I'm, I'm curious, many of my uh, Methodist beloved are um, holding up as hopeful the statement that the Western jurisdiction made at the end of the, the conference. And I, I hope you will forgive my complete ignorance about Methodist policy, uh, polity, despite my, my doctorate from Duke University. Uh, <laughs> I, I understand that- Conservative, that, but, conservative postured school too. Yes. yes. Um, so I understand that, that representatives from the Western jurisdiction, which I guess is the Western section of the United States announced basically that they would be one church and they would not abide by this discrimination, but I have no idea what that means or, or, or why I, I want to, I want to see the hope that, that, that the people that I love that see hope in that um, are seeing. And, and I just, um, I, I hope that you can unpack that a little bit for us. Uh, that statement was a bold statement to make. There are other annual conferences and jurisdictions that are thinking in similar ways. What that statement simply says is that we will not abide by this legislation that will appear in our highest order uh, or our, our rules, which is our book of discipline. To say that you will not abide by the book of discipline is at the same time saying that you are willing to, to face church trial for your, uh, what is considered disobedience or being out of, out of covenant. It's a bold move because church trials cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. I'm currently serving as the, as the co-counsel uh, for a clergy person who uh, is being attacked and for, uh, against whom uh, persons have filed um, uh, um, complaints and he may ultimately be brought to trial. Uh, that trial could result in, in him being defrocked, that is his orders being taken. And so I'm serving as his counsel and I know the huge cost uh, for saying you won't abide by the book of discipline for the Western jurisdiction to say they will not abide by a petition and the petition will ultimately become church law. For them to say they won't abide by church law is a bold move. I want to say, I want to advance a vision of hundreds of LGBTQ persons and hundreds of affirming persons. Uh, should this traditional plan be approved um, or should we even go back to where we are? I, I advance a kind of uh, a revolution against the polity of the United Methodist Church. And that is persons saying quite boldly what uh, the, the polity says we cannot say. 
and placing their orders and placing their membership, because it's not only about clergy orders, this is about membership in our church, placing that on the line and risking being brought to church trial. Can you clarify the uh, membership? We, we should that? break the bank. Dr. Um, Lacey, can you uh, clarify In terms of revolution. That? If church trial is what they want, they ought to give them. And I, for one, am prepared for that. Can you clarify the member piece of this? I understand the clergy piece. What, what's the member piece? Yes, um, about a decade ago, there was a inclusion that went to judicial council. It was called 1032, judicial council ruling 1032. And that ruling was about a, a gay man who presented himself for membership in a United Methodist Church. The pastor refused to give him membership unless he recanted uh, his, his sexual identity. And that led to a, I mean, a big conversation, a ruling by the church, a stance and a position that is still a matter of, uh, for our church today. And, and, and so, not only clergy are at risk, but as a result of these kinds of, 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 of charges and stances by clergy and by other persons, their membership is at risk. So I, I you know, we don't talk enough about how membership is at risk, but it is. I, uh... You, many of us, we're on the <clears throat> outside looking in, yet we have um, people in our lives who, uh, who are greatly affected by this. Um, in particular, I have uh, 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 two friends who are, they are a couple and they are greatly affected by this. But why don't you know, those of us who are um, in the community um, looking in and seeing this happening and, and we would like to do something, what, if anything, can we do as as clergy, as, as people who love um, people who are affected by this, what, if anything, can we do? Well, yeah, I think I've heard from so many of you all, and I, I, I tried to respond while I was sending information over social media about how excuse me pardon me I, I, um, I tried to say to you all just how deeply um, and uh, touching your various responses over social media to the work that we were doing was and is to know that there are people who love us and who support us all over the world gave us strength in those hours. I mean, I had people touching me and showing me Facebook posts and what people were saying and how people were supporting us. And we were reading this. I want you all to know we're reading what you say. We're hearing what you say. And it is giving us strength and encouragement. So that's one aspect. Other denominations sent their leadership to be with us at General Conference. And they were there giving out hugs and um, just really comforting, um, particularly our young, young folk, our, our young folk who were stunned and devastated by this. Older people like me, I was, I was stunned. I wasn't shocked by it. So supporting us with your loving, your prayers is so wonderful. You don't have a voice in the polity and the legislation of our church, but you can also support us with any, I mean, we have various groups that do this kind of work. Meg has already pointed to some of our work. They need, they need donations as to keep doing the kind of work they do. Uh, Reconciling Ministries Network is one that I can think of. Methodists for Social Action, MFSA is another one. Uh, that do this kind of work and support us um, all the time. Um, that's another way. And, um, and then um, the third way is, you know, our leadership, they, 
they read letters, you know, they read the letters that are being sent, they read the correspondence. The United Methodist Church is, is an institution and it's also a particular brand. And so most institutions protect their branding. And when they know their branding is being hurt, they know they need to respond. And so you can help us by also um, just doing your good work of writing of what we're doing here today. Uh, all the ways we lift this up in the public sphere is important. I have a, I have a follow-up question to that. I, I, I apologize if somebody else was trying to speak. At the same time, I also hear um, a lot of us speaking holier than thou and all of that also. And I wanted to know what is not helpful in this moment to you? What, you know, what is not helpful? With? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm rather gracious. I'm more gracious, I think, in this regard than I've seen others. So I, I want to say that very gently, it doesn't help us right now for, despite the goodwill of many of our denominations and faith communities to say, well, you know, if you leave, you can come here. It doesn't help us right now to uh, have persons invite us to become members of their churches, their faith groups, primarily because all gatherings of faith communities have these isms within them. All right, so there's no perfect gathering of people of faith. As much as I love my UU colleagues, you all have ish that you're going through also. So um, I, I think that doesn't help us, but what Unitarian Universalists and other denominations can do is lock arms with us and work against the isms of life within all of our faith communities. Let's work against white supremacy together. Let's work against sexism together. Let's, let's work against classism and ableism together. Let's work against xenophobia, homophobia, and transphobia together. Don't invite us into a ship that has the same problems. That's, that's the basic thing. But help us join with us in trying to build a better faith community, which is what we're left to do right now as United Methodists because United Methodism as it once was, is dead. Um, I, have, I have a question and, I, and it goes back to some of the origins of this stuff that I'm hearing. Can you hear me okay? Um, I heard Bishop Yvette Flunder say years ago that some of the evangelists slash colonialism work that happened that was being done by extreme conservative Christians in the continent of Africa um, was in part responsible for some of the really homophobic legislation and stuff that was coming out of those countries at that time. And I'm wondering, and, and, and I don't, I'm just wondering how much of this is exported hate that is now coming home to roost and hurting the people that I know here. I just, I'm, I'm, and I don't know if it's going to be useful or not, but I have this urge to understand how this happened. So Yvette Flunder is a dear friend of mine. She's going to be given an honorary doctorate at Meadville. Uh, this commencement. Yes, of course. Yeah. So uh, dear friends know that we're bringing in a giant and honoring her work. Uh, and so I'll start there. Secondly, I want to say that I'm, I'm still shying away from attributing uh, a level of conservatism to African delegates. Uh, yes, what you say is absolutely correct about uh, the conservative work in Africa and this, this kind of exportation of bigotry. But historically, historically, this exportation of bigotry did not begin with this 
this uh, era of conservatism. Uh, this, this, this kind of, this is why I speak about colonialism, because at the very first onset of a way of thinking about the biblical text as um, a, an, an absolute terms, and this goes back centuries, to think about the, the biblical text in absolute terms was the beginning of the seeds of what you are seeing now emanating not only from our delegate from Africa, but our delegates in the United States itself. History alone, especially for my denomination and especially for my culture, for black people, history alone uh, has within it this, the, the ways that slavocracy, the ways that colonialism utilize the Bible utilize the Bible in a very kind of wicked literal perspective to other folk. So the, the biblical text being used to say that black people were, and our, my African ancestors were less than human and to use the Bible to say slaves be, be obedient to your masters, to use the Bible to preach sermons to keep Africans in bondage here in America. This is centuries old, you see. This is so you see what I'm what I'm pointing to. I'm pointing to this element of using a sacred text against the people. And now this way of using a sacred text against another group of people, the LGBTQ community. This is not new, my dear friends. This is old. Um, and having said that, while I point to the, the Bible as a sacred text, I dare say there are many sacred texts that are used, including, I mean, I studied the, the Holy Quran. That even is used to oppress and discriminate, okay? So I, I'm, I, I try to think more broadly um, and to think about the human element. I have a low anthropology, by the way. I think human beings will use whatever kind of resource and will posture themselves in whatever ways that they feel will be to their, to their advantage to lift themselves up over another group of people. Doesn't matter where you are, it happens. And so we've got to constantly fight against that. I hope that that kind of answers your question. I think there might be a class syllabus behind that little three minutes of conversation. Amen. Well, there actually, there is. I'm teaching, I'm, teaching, I'm teaching spirituality and social justice activism in the African American traditions this semester. And I will cover uh, some of the history of bigotry and discrimination and the ways in which the biblical text uh, has been and is being used uh, in our country and across and, uh, and across our various spheres. So that's the spring. So thank you for that shameless plug, Meg. I wish I could be there. I wish I could be there. I think that uh, the, the storyline that gets, as I said, in mainstream white media is not helpful to any of us. And really, it's, it's this, I was arguing with a friend last night about it, who was like, you know, it happens every time there's a homophobic vote in the United States, too, that Black people are blamed for it. And I'm like, look at the numbers. There is this huge base of white bigotry underneath this. You know, you, you can't say this is what tipped it over. You have to look at that base, you know. So yeah, it's, it is an international um, crisis, I would say. Um, we have a bunch of people writing and commenting and I just wanna lift up that a number of them are just talking about their own pain about this. And um, that, you know, I, I, you mentioned the young people, Dr. Lightsey, and that's certainly who's most on my mind. Were they organized at the conference? Were the young queers um, visible and, part of the, I mean, God, people aren't listening to their own children. That breaks my heart. But were, were some of the delegates young folks? Yes, young people were listening. Young LGBTQ persons were involved in working with one another. 
um, I'm, I was very happy about a statement that was signed by young people from across uh, the denomination. Uh, they opened it up and within 13 hours, they had 15,000 persons who signed on to this statement from young people addressed to our church, um, um, beseeching our church not to take this discriminatory stance. So the young people are doing their good work. It was our responsibility, at least I felt it my responsibility to pay attention to the young people who were there, who were hurting. This has been part of what I've been doing for quite some time to, to provide comfort and to be a, a person who really does try to do a work, keeping in mind that what we do, um, our young people are, are, you know, they will be here after we're, we're gone and we need to do our best to leave this denomination, to leave our faith communities as better places. And another question, what does it mean that the court is now gonna look at this? Like, who's the court? What's the timeline? What do you think are the chances? Like who, <laughs> I mean, if you look at the US Supreme Court right now, that's not good news if something is going to the high court. So I just wonder who, who is that and what do you think will happen there? Well, the Judicial Council uh, is, I mean, this is all Methodist history in some ways, is set up, our denomination itself is set up politically very much like uh, the United States because when it was established, it was in the early beginnings of the country itself. So our Judicial Council will receive, has received the petition uh, as it was amended. It is reviewing the petition member and if we will have a word I don't know I don't even want to speculate some say within days others say it will take them until April I don't I haven't really looked at that uh closely enough to give you a better <coughs> excuse me a better answer I can say that the makeup of the judicial council is much like the makeup of our delegates in terms of what we understand their theological positions to be. Um, but that doesn't give us a sense of what their decision will be uh, because they are supposed to abide, uh, their decisions are supposed to be guided by church law and by precedence, precedence. So uh, there's no way to, to determine the final outcome, many of us, including myself, speculate that much of the traditional plan as went to them will be gutted and determined as unconstitutional. What will that mean? That will mean that uh, legislatively, we will likely be quite close to where we started out when we came to this general conference in 2019. We have our regular quadrennial conference next year in 2020. Between now and 2020, many petitions will go to our annual conferences. We'll go to the general conference, excuse me, we'll discuss them in our annual conference. They'll go to our general conference and we will see um, what is before us in 2020. For those of us that remain with the church, um, my opinion about the work of General Conference next year is that the ultimate work of our General Conference next year will be uh, uh, the, um, um, the, uh, the taking care of what is now a schism, um, a major uh, church in crisis and our schism. And how do we, how do we separate amicably to, to the extent that even one can even use that word, but how do we separate? Uh, no one else is asking, so I'm going to ask you another question. You mentioned that the American bishops were very hopeful going into this, and, and it sounds like we're allies to a more progressive vision. Does that, this is, as Michael said, my ignorance about Methodist polity. Does their being a bishop give them any authority, or this, this is over everybody? The bishops at General Conference, the bishop's position is to uh, chair the general conference. They do not have a vote. And so they have, 
you know, that they, they don't have, they didn't have any authority uh, to establish the uh, one church plan. Uh, their place at General Conference was to, to guide us and to see what the will of the body was. Uh, someone uh, posted um, a statement which has me thinking. The, um, let me make sure I give this person credit. Uh, but what they said was the average age of a Methodist today, John Camp, is 61. So uh, what do you think that might mean for the with um with a um with this kind of result what do you think that might mean at least here in the u.s for the methodist church if anything the methodist church is in schism right now so the age of the average methodist currently is almost is almost irrelevant because we're in schism and no matter what your age is, that schism impacts you. We are graying. It, truth is, yes, it, we are as we as we were before General Conference. We were a graying denomination. We, like many other mainline Protestant denominations, were losing members in rapid numbers. So we were losing. We were declining in our membership. Where we saw hope, and, and this is the truth, was in our affirming churches and the rise in the membership in our affirming churches. And so I imagine that now that our denomination is in schism, uh, we will heed that um, 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 statistic and know that our best way to live as a community is to live as a fully inclusive organism, whatever that may be. I'm no longer, of, I wrote about this, that, this this morning, I'm no longer at the mind of the mind that what we shall become will be an institutional church. I think that what we should become is a community of, of it's, it's more should probably be called a beloved community of faith. And so if we are working towards being the beloved community of faith, then a lot of our attention to um, uh, legislation and a kind of top-down and hierarchical way of being will likely disappear in the next iteration of Methodism uh, because it will, it, will, it will be Methodism. How that Methodism will look um, is yet to be known. So that leaves me with one last question. I know we're going to finish up. Um, it, I, I've known so many Methodists over the years who are the champions of justice. I mean, it is a faith that really seems with this schism, just seems weird about it, about the people I know who are, it is, it is John Wesley that they call up the way that universalists call up our theology to, to do action. So I'm really curious what you think, and, and this is a ridiculous question for any of us, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Like what you think the core of um, Methodist identity is for people? Because what you just described is a radical change in polity, but, but you're saying it's still Methodist. So I wonder what, what that means when you say it, or if you can possibly say that. I know this stuff is kind of alchemical in a weird way, but. So my internet signal was unstable. Would you quickly repeat your question? What do you think is the core of Methodist identity beyond polity, beyond books of, you know, this and that, beyond structure? What do you think is the core that, that people call up for courage and justice? Uh, I would say without a doubt, it is our social prin principles. It is our attention to liberation and justice that has been at the core of who we are for many, many years. Uh, and I think that is what we'll call up. And I think even now we're paying attention to it. Our social principles are not unlike your seven principles, um, which is you know, my joy in working with Unitarian Universalists. It's this kind, it's this, it is this attention to justice. 
Um, and I'm wondering if, if I'm still on board with you all, if, if I broke up there, I hope I didn't. No, that came through really clearly. Yeah. And I, I just want to lift up. That's what I said when your, when your uh, signal was bad is that Methodists have been some of the most fierce, devoted, courageous justice warriors that I've worked with. And this is just an nice. affront. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Thank you. So I want to shout out to Rebecca Parker, who could not join us today because she was at the dentist, but who also has been involved with this for many years and to, to all of the fighters. Next week, <laughs> we're going to come to a close now that I'm a mess. Next thank week. Thank you all. Thank you all for having me. It's thank you so much. I know it's you. pretty raw right now, and I really appreciate your willingness to talk. Um, it is. It, you it, may it, well have more to say later, and we'd love to have you back when, when things are in a different place after the court, court or whatever it's called. I want you all to know how much I've grown to love you all. Mm. Um, and I appreciate um, the work that you all are doing and the history that you have for social justice. And um, Margalee, thank you for inviting me, knowing my crazy schedule. And uh, <laughs> any way that I can be hopeful, helpful, please always let me know. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much for saying yes. And I am so yeah. looking forward to seeing you next month. Yay. Yeah. And next week, we'll have Julica Herman Fuentes talking about how we can use covenant to challenge the status quo. I'm excited about that. So see you then. Take care. <laughs>